Man, anybody who knows Reverend John knows that there is one issue above all, one set of people above all that are very, very dear to his heart. He says it again and again, and you can see by the way he treats a certain set of people that they are dear to his heart. I'm talking about children. Very, very concerned. And because it is Child Month, he has chosen to speak on this first Sunday in Child Month about children. We listen as he tells us his thoughts on children and children's issues. Reverend John, help me welcome him. Morning, family. Thank you, Reverend Michael. I, I'm actually not going to talk about picnic in Ting, but uh, we will touch on, on that because, as you know, they are dear to my heart. I just want to add my own words of welcome and to say welcome to those who are joining us on the World Wide Web as well. I did title my encouragement, as I call my, my messages, A Little Child Shall Lead Them. Because Isaiah the prophet foretells a time when the lion and the lamb will feed together. A time when all creation, all nature will coexist in the harmony and peace God intended. And so Isaiah said, a little child shall lead them. And since May is Child Month, I, I thought I would start by, by sharing with you a chuckle which I received by email from a fellow uh, Centers for Spiritual Living Minister overseas. You see, one of her Sunday school teachers asked her class to draw pictures of their favorite Bible stories. And she was a little puzzled because little Johnny's picture showed four people on an airplane. So she said, Johnny, I'm not quite sure uh, which Bible story it, it, you, you are meaning to represent. The flight to Egypt, he said, in that tone of voice children use when they are explaining to us adults what they consider to be obvious. I see, said the teacher. So, so then, four people on the airplane. So that must be Mary. Oh yes, and Joseph, and baby Jesus. But who is the fourth person? Oh, that's Pontius, the pilot. <laughs> You gotta love them. And I always love the fact that they call every troublemaking picnic Little Johnny. Yes. Every Sunday when the kids come up and the teens to the podium, I find myself thinking, you know, people say they're our future, but they're not our future. Our children are our now. They really are here, and one of the things that we want to do as part of our the Thriving Ministry Initiative is really to engage them and to, to, to find out how we can meet their needs. Um, because they are the, the ministers and practitioners and the leaders of tomorrow, but they are here now. And I will talk a little bit about how we, we need to honor and respect that. In Matthew 18, verses 1 to 3, we read, and I quote, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. I wanted a journey this morning. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. End of that scripture. But Jesus, as we know, my friends, was not referring to a geographical location, but rather to the state of consciousness that results from knowing that we are inextricably bound up with God. There is no degree of separation between ourselves and God. The founder of religious science, Dr. Ernest Holmes, commenting on this passage in Matthew says, and I quote, Jesus understood 
that the childlike mind is more receptive to truth than the over-intellectual who demand too rational an explanation of those truths which must be accepted on faith alone. And you know, there are some occurrences that we simply cannot explain by using the human logic. Last week I had an amazing example of this and I wanted to share it with you because it, 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 well, it, blew, it blew my mind. Reverend Sonia Davidson, Michael Record, and Shand and I drove over on Friday evening to Franklin D. Resorts in Runaway Bay and held our weekly meeting, ministers meeting on Saturday morning at that resort. After our meeting on Saturday, the executive manager of the hotel asked to see me. And here's what she wanted to see me about. So she took me, first of all, I took Reverend Tan with me because I said, why well, she want to see me? She knows that she must talk to you if it's about, about business, you know. So I took Reverend Tan, God bless her. And then the executive manager said, well, it's not really about uh, business. So Reverend Tan very discreetly disappeared, melted into, um, you know, the woodwork. And we sat down together, this lady and I, and she said, well, I'd left, Reverend, I don't want to impose on you, but Mr. Rance, who is the, the, the proprietor and the owner, has a business partner, and let me tell you, he has cancer. And in, in sharing with him, uh, Mr. Rance said, do you have a church? And do you have a, a minister that can you know, be with you on this journey? And he said, no, not really, but there's a place in Kingston called the Temple of Light. And there's a man at that place called Reverend John Scott. Um, and if I was there, that would be my church. He said, 10 years ago, a, f a friend of mine, he did the Thanksgiving service for a friend of mine, and that's what I want. You can imagine Frankie Rance's face, because he said, you know, I just wrote his name, booked him a suite, and he'll be here tomorrow morning. Wow. wow. So I said to her, so you'd like me to see him? She said, well, we'd be so grateful if you could, if you could speak with him. And I said, sure, you know, it, it, where does he live? We had gone down on Nutswood Express, so I didn't have any, 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 any car of my own. She said, well, he happens to be on the property right now. And then she walks me down to the pool bar. I needed it. And there we met. Um, and I was able to give him some words of whatever chair and comfort and um, I ministered to him. And I'm returning to FDR this Wednesday to conduct his celebration of life service. I mean, it, the, the universe is so exquisite. First of all, I don't normally go on, on, on trips um, you know, to the no North Coast. Normally it would be Reverend Anne and, and um, Janet Morris Henry who would go and scout out locations for retreats and what have you. But we just said, let us go and see. Um, we're, you know, looking at, at possible locations, and the, Mr. Rance very kindly accommodated us, complimentary accommodation and what have you. And I, I wouldn't normally have gone. And my friends, I just want you to know that you never know whose life you are touching. That was 10 years ago I did that service for his, his, fr his friend. And 10 years later, Spirit says, you have another job to do. So, you know, when you sign up, dress up and show up, I dress up. But you don't need to dress up. Spirit will take you as you come, but you, you need to just say, here am I, <laughs> send me, and be available for the work that we have come here to do. It, it is just awesome and mind-blowing. So, I just want you to know that, that there are no mistakes, there are no coincidences, there are no, it's all in divine order. It is all perfect. Don't, and children accept that. Children don't, don't argue and say, but that doesn't make sense and um, that's not logical. They just open their hearts and allow life to flow. I just have to exhale for a second. Mm-hmm. Little children, as I said, don't question the synchronicities I just described. Um, 
so we must become as little children. Dr. Holmes puts it in the Science of Mind um, textbook on page 456, and I quote, how we long for a return of that simple trust in life which children have. In their minds, there are no doubts. They have not yet been told that they are sinners. Well, that's when they're very young. I got told I was a sinner very early. <laughs> and until I came to this church, I thought I had invented it. Um, I've said it from this platform many, many times, but I'll say it again. The first Sunday I walked in here, our founder, Reverend Elmo Lumsden, was talking about sin. And, you know, I had been, my grandmother had said that every time I was naughty, I personally hammered a nail into the hands of the, the Messiah, you know, so I thought I literally had crucified him myself. And Reverend Tamar was talking about sin being a term from archery. But when archers aim for the bullseye and they miss the mark, they are said to have sinned. And I thought, wow, may I come to the church? Yeah. You know, this is a, this is a place that I can, I can find myself and my relationship with God. So I just blessed the day I crossed the threshold of this temple and discovered my relationship with the divine. And that is why, my friends, I signed up for ministry, really, because I want to share that with people. And my experience at FDR this past week has taught me that I don't need to worry about whether they're here f filling the seats. I want to see a full church, but we are also, each of us, each one of us, a minister of this teaching. And wherever we go, we are taking that message and touching lives in ways that some of us will never, ever know. That is the purpose of the thriving ministry, to touch, to heal, to bless, to love and liberate everybody whose paths we cross. Dr. Holmes says, we must return the way we came. So, as little children who know that life is good and to be trusted, we are to approach our problems as though they were not. And approaching the, them in this manner, when, when we approach them in this manner, they will vanish, end of that quote. So I have an assignment for you this week. I want you, first of all, you might think this strange, but if you can, I want you to dig up a photo of yourself when you were a small child. Spend some quiet time contemplating that photograph and loving the child you were. And if you can't put your hands on, an, on such a photograph, then just bring to mind a memory of yourself. Just become quiet and remember yourself as a little one and do the same thing. Beam love at yourself. You know, many of us don't feel very loved and didn't feel very loved when we were little. But even if you were fortunate, I came from a very loving home, but I hadn't learned to love myself all the same. You know, I needed it constantly to be expressed by somebody else. And it wasn't until I came here that I learned that we also need to turn within and express that love to who we are. So I want you to do that and you will be surprised to know that, that you, you still carry that little one within you. Thank you, Carmen. You are so sweet. If you didn't exist, we'd have to invent you. <laughs> the second part of your, uh, your assignment um, is as a part of your daily spiritual practice, I want you to write a sentence or two. It can be a nursery rhyme or a, 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 a line from one of the psalms, your favorite psalm, I want you to write a sentence with your non-dominant hand. In other words, if you're right-handed, I want you to write it with your left hand. And if you're left-handed, I want you to write it with your right hand. There's something about doing this, and you will see when you do it that it looks like a little child's handwriting. Um, and it helps to balance the two hemispheres of your brain, and it's very therapeutic. So number one, find a picture of yourself and love yourself. Number two, um, write with your non-dominant hand. And finally, schedule some fun time with a child, a grandchild, a godchild, a niece, a nephew, uh, this week. As the epigraph of Sandra Cooper's affirmative prayer reminds us on page two of your program, the first purpose of the soul when it incarnates is to play. So often we, we get so grown up we forget how to play. Start to romp a little. 
And I want you to resist the do's and don'ts that we are so, uh, that are so familiar to children, and the shoulds and shouldn'ts, and avoid that if I were you. I would, or I wouldn't, you know, you know how, when we want to correct children, we say, well, darling, if I were you, I wouldn't wear that dress. It doesn't look so right for church. Hello, the picnic to express herself and wear what she wants. The late Catholic mystic Father Anthony de Mello tells a story that illustrates the if I were you syndrome. I got a beating actually now because my mother had used it to me. She said, if I were you, I, I, I wouldn't do that. And I said, but you're not me. What am? <laughs> so the other thing is you learn very early, don't, 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 don't back chat. But according to Anthony de Mello, de Mello, one evening an entire family went out to dinner at a local restaurant. Everyone got a menu, even the youngest, her name was Amy, Amy, who was six years old. And since the conversation was an adult one, Amy sat there, ignored. When the waitress took their orders, she came to Amy last. And what would you like to eat, young lady, she asked. Amy answered, I'll have a hamburger, french fries, and a, a large Coke. No, said her mother, if I were you, I'd have a small salad with low-fat dressing, baked chicken, carrots, and a little boiled rice. And the father muttered, and milk, not Coke. The waitress looked at Amy and asked, and would you like a ketchup or a mustard, mustard on your hamburger? <laughs> Amy said, ketchup please, with, fr with fried onions on top. Oh, and put a very small piece of lettuce on top to please my parents. <laughs> Thank you so much. As the waitress walked away to place the order, Amy turned toward her family and said, you know what? She thinks I'm real. Yes, she thinks I'm real. So often we treat our children as if they are some sort of cardboard, two-dimensional, cut out, them not real. And then when they say certain things, you know they're not real. <laughs> serve your right. When others don't pay attention to our presence, we feel as though we are objects to be maintained or avoided or fixed, rather than real human beings to be treated with respect and dignity, don't we? On the other hand, when someone listens to us, we feel loved and we feel real. Let's give our children this gift of recognition. Khalil Gibran, the Lebanese-American writer, poet, and artist, expresses it beautifully in his immortal work, The Prophet. Speaking of children, he says, you may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you, for life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness. For even as he loves the arrow that flies, he loves also the bow that is stable. My friends, in our children, as in all of us, there is a wisdom and power not of the flesh, which springs perennially from the inner life, the all-powerful and all-wise source of all. It is God the good, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and omniactive force. No matter how small the child, this, this presence and this power is walking life's way with them. It is the wisdom of God within them. Learn to trust it. Trust as a little child trusts. And may you come to trust it with the simple faith of a little kid so that each of you may continue as our children to grow in spirit and in truth, and to be our now forevermore. Namaste.